paragraphs here, but let's take turns just blasting through. Okay. Through them, and uh, we'll end at around nine or shortly after. Okay. Uh, around nine, my time. Right. Okay. I'm going to. Yeah, I have a uh, five o'clock wake up. Tomorrow. Oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, good evening, everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about um, what has happened to our culture. And it didn't start last week or last month or during the you know, the Bush administration or any other such thing. It started long, long ago. And so Dr. Young, in writing this article, he was writing it in the 19 teens, more than 100 years ago. And he's observing these phenomena now or then. And we're, we're observing them in real time uh, today. So I'm going to go ahead and read uh, essay 427 or paragraph 427, and then we'll keep going. Uh, please do feel free, feel free to comment. Okay, 427. The growth of culture consists, as we know, in a progressive subjugation of the animal in man. It is a process of domestication which cannot be accomplished without rebellion on the part of the animal nature that thirsts for freedom. From time to time, there passes, as it were, a wave of frenzy through the ranks of men too long constrained within the limitations of their culture. Antiquity experienced it in the Dionysian or orgies that surged over from the east and became an essential and characteristic ingredient of classical culture. The spirit of these orgies contributed not a little toward the development of the Stoic ideal of asceticism in the innumerable sects of philosophical school and philosophical schools of the last century before Christ, which produced from the uh, polytheistic chaos of that epoch the twin aesthetic, ascetic religions of Mithraism and Christianity. A second wave of Dionysian licentious, licentiousness, licentiousness swept over the West at the Renaissance. It is difficult to gauge the spirit of one's own time, but if one, if we observe the trend of art, of style, and of public taste, and see what people read and write what sort of societies they found, what questions are the order of the day, what the Philistines fight against, we shall find that in the long catalog of our present social questions, by no means the last is the so-called sexual question. This is discussed by men and women who challenge the existing sexual mor morality and who seek to throw off the burden of moral guilt, which past centuries have heaped upon Eros. One cannot simply deny the existence of these endeavors, nor condemn them as indefensible. They exist and probably have adequate grounds for their existence. It is more interesting and more useful to examine carefully the underlying causes of these contemporary movements than to join in the lamentations of the professional mortar, mortars of morality who, with hysterical unction, prophet, <laughs> prophesy the moral downfall of humanity. It is, the way, <laughs> it is the way of moralists not to put the slightest trust in God as if they thought that the good tree of humanity flourished only by dint of being pruned, tied back, and trained on a trellis, whereas, in fact, Father, Son, and Mother Earth have allowed it to grow from their, for their delight in accordance with deep, wise laws. 
<laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, well, I mean, the, I think this, I can, to go anecdotally, the president, the prime minister of France, when the Bill Clinton sexual scandal was going on, he, he, when he heard about it, he laughed and he was on air. He laughed and he said, it just goes to show how much you Americans are sexual prudes. We in France would have run a campaign on this for our virility. And, and it just said what Jung is saying here, this, you know, prune and tie back and train on a trellis. I hate to say this, but those who doth protest too much, that sounds like bondage, frankly, of the tree. So right. they have this asexual bondage going on that has nothing to do with training the tree except restraining and um, vampiring the arrows out by just suffocating right. it. Right. And um, well, let's see. How did the how did the young saying go? Uh, too much civilization. Um, too much freedom. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, it shows the well, juxtaposition. Too, yeah, too, much, too much freedom stifles civilization, and too much civilization stifles freedom. Right. And, and, and so what he's saying here is that culture, as soon as you do culture to anything, uh, you are already trying to change human nature. And I guess that's what I'm running into in the schools, which is pure, unadulterated human nature. <laughs> and, well, yeah, because they're having the rebellion for that right. being pressure cooked, closed down. And I mean, as he says, as we know, in a progressive subjugation of the animal and man, right. and you, you know, I'm always talking about capital in nature, capital in nature, mm -hmm. and that civilizations that are separated from nature quickly cause uncivilized behavior. And this is speaking to that. Right. And of course, um, what um, the what is true about sexuality is, as uh, as Dr. Edinger said, um, Mother Nature is imperious, and so yeah, <laughs> people will find a way. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, just yeah. You know, with with all the consequences, and so it's it's very obvious that many uh, young women get themselves in a problem, um, and they need to be uh, in, um, you know, duly warned. But there's plenty of pro promiscuity out there in society. That's for sure. Well, totally. And I have to say, too, the people who are so against sex ed or even showing any even diagrammatic genitalia, and then they wonder why all these girls get pregnant. Well, it's the guys, too, you know, making that happen. But they, they then, nature is imperious, will wander into that themselves beyond their control because it's a natural urge, but without any education of the consequences. And it's kind of like making a, you can, you can make a mistake in a car 200 miles an hour and learn. You typically can't make a mistake in a, on a motorcycle at 200 miles an hour and learn. That's usually it. Um, and so they're, they're playing literally with bonfires with them that they've never even seen. And then, you know, they get infatuated, swept over. Everything's so goo goo gaga, but it's all that because it's just, going against the intellect that they've been ruled over with instead of the intellect that's colored by a proper eros you know life within it well yeah and you know you have to know well first of all we don't have we we have 50 percent divorces in this country uh because basically because young women have been improperly trained okay and so they're taught and young men. huh and young and, men. and young men but especially young women who say boy one transgre transgression and the marriage is over 
Well, sometimes things happen, you know, um, and, you know, if you've got 10 years or 15 years uh, invested in marriage, uh, it's really silly to break it up uh, over a single transgression or even two. Um, you know, you have to have a, a reasonable un understanding with one another about how you're going to live, but um, it doesn't mean that that you know one transgression and the family should be broken up and that's one of the problems that we have in modern society is we have all these broken families and many children especially young men who are being raised by mothers and not with no father in the picture and so now the schools are hiring uh men to be part of the uh student services team and what the, what these men do is is serve the role that your co your coach used to serve coming mm -hmm. down the hallway. I had one of them sit in in uh, two of my classes all the way through today, and he did a beautiful drawing in that period. Um, and so, uh, anyway, okay, why don't you read Sport Twenty Eight? Well, I think really between, before we do, just two quick points on okay. that divorce rate piece one no one's taught is when i won't say no one that's that's an absolute and that's absurd um few are taught <clears throat> how to resolve conflict and how to actually utilize their emotions without thinking someone's going to run away there's a whole big abandonment syndrome thing going on right. the other so that when you know indiscretion or similar comes up it's, you know, it's all over. I mean, because they're used to, oh, they got in trouble, so now it's done. No one loves them anymore. Though they take that juvenile nature into their relationships, and then also we're dealing with a, a polar counterpart to that, which is that up until the mid 70s, it was dang hard for a woman to get her name on the title of a property. I mean, plenty did, but a lot of marriages stayed together simply because if they went out on their own, they would literally be hanging themselves out to dry. Sure. And so I think that goes along with it. And that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother volume by itself. Cause that, yeah. we, we could deal with that standalone, but I think the big piece is the intercommunication between people emotionally, intellectually, especially when the trouble happens. Cause well, that's and I, I do happens. think we ought to have some proper psychological training of people when they're, um, you know, no later than the seventh grade, right. where where they're taught to grow up. Because you know, my issue with my first wife was that, um, you know, she expected me to be her father and to solve all her problems, and meanwhile, she didn't want to do her part, which was to. Um, you know, give give me a fair chance, considering what I was trying to do and trying to do in my life. And uh, so she, every time she would have an argument with me, she'd bring up everything from the beginning of our relationship every time. And, you know, after a while, it got pretty old. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it takes took my departure for her to force her to grow up and realize That's it. you have to take I mean, adult yeah. responsibility. Yeah, the child has now become the parent of the woman. And when people supplant their parent onto their partner, one, it says that they have not become an adult themselves. Right. And that, that whole Gatlin gun that's actually on beyond automatic firing with a never ending magazine. Um, right. <clears throat> that goes and goes and goes comes up. I think oftentimes when they're trying to prove how powerful they are to better the parent, except the problem is they're done. They're dealing with an adult who finds it just frustrating. And even if you see it, they're still a wow, they're too far gone because they never came far enough in the first place. Yeah. And we just, uh, I, I just got tired of, of arguing the same argument. 
uh, over and over and over again. When 95% of it was over, it didn't need to come up again. And it's so, like Groundhog's Day for a court proceeding. It's right. Like, Hi, Judge, it, we're going to do the same thing again today. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have the same verdict. Let's and, go and, ahead and go all the way through it. So, uh, and so I have a, a pact with my uh, lovely wife, Debbie, which is that if ever we have a disagreement, uh, once it's over, it's over, and we will never speak of it again. And that has served us extremely well over the years. And uh, what, what's interesting about that is some people might think that's too rigid, but the reality of it is that is actually a tool that's taught in some relationships, such that you always have to deal with the present. You can't go mining for some fool's gold in the past yeah. none of that is here now and those feelings that happened before don't even apply now right um, not even almost as memories they might right. give you perspective but it keeps you dealing with the argument and it keeps you from offloading off into some trauma you've had your whole life right. and you can stay as an adult right here so in a sense that's a technique that trains people how to understand that conflict doesn't have to be war right Okay, so your right. turn to read 428. Serious-minded people know that there is something of a sexual problem today. They know that the rapid development of, their ta of the towns with the specialization of work brought about by the extraordinary division of labor, the increasing industrialization of the countryside, and the growing mm -hmm. sense of insecurity deprive men, and now women, of many opportunities for giving vent to their effective energies. The peasants' alternating rhythm of work secures them unconscious satisfactions through their symbolical content, satisfactions which the factory workers and office employees do not know and can never enjoy. What do these know of his life with nature? What do these know of his life with nature or their life with nature? of those grand moments when, as Lord and fructifier of the earth, they drive their plow through the soil and with a king, king, kingly, with a kingly gesture, scatters the seed for the future harvest of his rightful fear of the destructive power of the elements, of his joy in the fruitfulness of his wife, who bears him the daughters and sons who mean increased working power and prosperity in brackets, alas, exclamation point. <laughs> From all this, we city dwellers, we modern machine minders are far removed. It is not the fairest and most natural of all satisfactions beginning to fail us when we can no longer regard with unmixed joy the harvest of our own sowing, the blessing of children. Marriages were no, marriages were no artifices are resorted to are rare. It is not this all, it is not this an all important departure from the joys which Mother Nature gave her firstborn son. Can such a state of affairs bring satisfaction? See how men slink to work, only observe the faces in trains at 7:30 in the morning. One man, man makes his little wheels go around, another writes things of that interest him, not at all. What wonder that nearly every man belongs to as many clubs as there are days in the week or that there are flourishing little societies for women where they can pour out on the hero of the latest cult, those inarticulate longings which the man drowns at the pub in big talk and small beer. These sources of discontent, to these sources of discontent, there is added a further and graver difficulty. Nature has armed defenseless and weaponless man with a vast store of energy to enable him not only passively to endure the rigors of existence, but also to overcome them. She has equipped her son for tremendous hardships and has placed a costly premium on the overcoming of them, as Schopenhauer well understood when he said that happiness is merely the cessation of unhappiness. As a rule, we are protected from the most pressing necessities. And for that reason, 
we are daily tempted to excess. For the animal and man, people, always becomes rampant unless hard necessity presses. But if we are high-spirited, in what orgiastic feasts and revels can we let off our surplus of energy? Our moral views forbid this outlet. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I used to be critical of athletic fans um, because I would say that, um, you know, they're not having an authentic life. They're just leaving the life of the game to these other people who are playing down mm -hmm. on the field. But uh, as this correctly points out, um, we we need something to blow off steam mm -hmm. and and um and so we don't we don't get it any other way than for men it's basically athletics although that's i lost interest in in sports about age 30 <laughs> and and so i don't uh, watch it anymore because I have plenty of other things to do. I have no trouble finding something to do in my life. But for people who work a 10 hour day, let's say in a, in a machine shop and they're exhausted at the end of the day or a school teacher, um, mm -hmm. you know, who, who gets up at five to leave the house at six to, uh, be home okay uh, four or five four thirty in the afternoon, but totally exhausted after pretty much a twelve hour day, and uh, you know how how do they have any outlet whatsoever? Um, and you know that gets dealt with, I guess, by by the tube these days by television and. Um, so you have the opportunity of of living something vicariously while you let your body <laughs> recover. Uh, well, it's it's like I I don't people say hey come over watch the game and I don't do that I don't do that anymore. Uh, I, it's I, I I noticed last week someone posting something on our college football team. You know we had the same alma mater, mm -hmm. and I just stopped dead in my tracks and I went. They never stopped going to the football games. Yeah. They they now take road trips, you know, ostensibly long weekends to drive back to watch. And I don't want to judge them, but at the same time, from my perspective, I'm like, no, when football season comes on, well, it's time for me to learn another hobby. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I'll go, I'll go occupy myself. And what's interesting is I used to be really judgmental about it and think, well, how juvenile you haven't grown out of that. But I realized that that's a rest and relief from work and a rest and relief from the relationship. And the relationship is a rest and relief from work and the activities after work and et cetera, et cetera. All three are that way. Right. But the relationship is more important because it's the, you get the public and the private both. And 20 years ago, I read a study called the, the man woman study which now it would probably be called the person to person study but what it was was self-employed couples versus regularly employed nine to five out of the home couples and the regularly so to speak employed couples spend approximately two to four hours conscious awake not asleep together mm -hmm. each day yeah 30 minutes to an hour and a half in the morning before the kids were off to school. Then they both went to work. They came home. You have to prepare dinner. There's this. They might get like an hour just sitting in bed talking and then they're zonked. And <laughs> so they had their average mean for a relationship was three and a half to five and a quarter hours a day, depending. Yeah. Well, the self-employed couples who both worked out of the house and who each had their own office were pretty much around each other 24-7. Yeah, especially the ones that had a you know conference table in their home office where people will come there. Sure. What they realized is the average mean there, because if you go to the bathroom, i.e. 
the water cooler at the office. Yeah. Odds are you're going to bump into your spouse right. and then you're going to start talking and then this and then and then do they feel rejected when you go back to work or vice versa? That what they realize, though, is taking out all those emotional pieces and just putting it on a number of hours. The couples who are self-employed were together an average of eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah. And, and what they realized, the three and three and a half to five and a quarter average mean couples would have, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 year relationships. Mm-hmm. And they realized that the other couples got to that connected quality in about six to 11 years. So they lived out a 60 year relationship in six or 10 years and it aged the relationship because they actually weren't getting enough reflection time. Mm -hmm. And it was just sensory overload of always, 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 always. So this whole thing about going to work, you know, you you get away. It's like, what is like Mae West said, Sonny, how am I going to miss you if you never leave? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's kind of the way Deb and I have been over the last, uh, I, I, anyway, 10 years where she's been largely working out of the home and, mm-hmm. and I was working out of the home and I, um, I, I still do that <laughs> in the middle of the night as opposed yeah. to, but I've also taken on this day job. So, um, you know, I've and you guys already had 30 years in your pocket, you know, more than or that, so yeah. more than that by that time. And so in that sense, there's a retirement from the, we can be a part land. Now we we're able to be together for extended periods of time without, you know, getting on each other's nerves. Yeah. too much. So Warren Falcon says, uh, which young volume are you reading from? It just, joining in now and the answer is volume seven of the collected works of C.G. Young uh, and you can get an electronic version of it from our Dropbox if uh, if you look there I normally send out Dropbox links I didn't do it this week but I almost always do I it just uh, it, it got by me today <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's a volume seven two essays in analytical psychology right okay so let's let's read on um so 729 let us reckon up the many sources of discontent the denial of continual procreation uh and giving birth for which purpose nature has endowed us with vast quantities of energy the monotony of our highly differentiated methods of labor which exclude any interest in the work itself, our effortless security against war, lawlessness, robbery, plague, child and female mortality. All this gives us some of surplus energy, which uh, needs must find an outlet. But how? Relatively uh, few create quasi-natural dangers for themselves in reckless sport. Many more seeking for some equivalent of the hard life in order to siphon off dangerous accumulations of energy that might burst out even more crazily are driven to alcoholic excess or expend themselves in the rush of money-making or in the frenzied performance of duties or in perpetual overwork. It is for such reasons that we have today a sexual question. The pent-up energy would like to get out here as it has done since time immemorial in periods of security and abundance. Under such circumstances, it is not only rabbits that multiply, men and women too uh, are made this made the sport of these whims of nature. The sport because their moral views have shut them up in a narrow cage. The excessive narrowness of Uh, of which was not felt so long as harsh necessity pressed with even greater constraint. But now it is too tight even for the city dweller. Temptation surrounds him on all sides, and like an invisible procurer, there (laughs) slinks through society the knowledge of the preventive methods that make everything unhappened. Unhappened. (laughs) 
Good <laughs> gosh. Carl, you're getting yeah. us in trouble here. <laughs> Well, I think he's, he's saying what needs to be said back then, which people need to hear now. I mean, it absolutely. He, he covered everything from addiction to inhibition to birth control to the incarceration of too narrow a cage to the excessive expansiveness of, you know, if you have too much freedom through too much abundance. I mean, he he had every he basically went back and forth like a bunch of pachinko balls on different polar right. points. And, and here he's talking about the unhappened, which means either, yeah. um, you know, uh, contraception or abortion. And, right. you know, the, the big thing is um, my grandmothers in the 1920s had five abortions between them. I don't know which one had two and which one had three. And I don't know any more details about it than that. That's a deep, dark family secret that my mother told me on her deathbed. Um, mm -hmm. One of two secrets that my mother told me on her deathbed. The other one was that she had voted for JFK in 1960. <laughs> well, see, the, 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 she had to find it the need to hold that information, you know, that innocent information back, just political opinion that hid that to cancel out your dad's vote. You know, it's like. <laughs> yeah. Um, Justin says, hello, Amela. Nice to see you. Um, so Justin says, um, uh, it's, Volume 7 is widely considered the best introduction to Jung. It's two essays, The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious, and On the Psychology of the Unconscious present the core of his system. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, okay, I sort of agree with that, but uh, it's a lot easier to get into Jung these days by reading either memory streams or reflections or man and his symbols um and um and so well and i think you, it actually if you're gonna to if you're gonna get point. into young by reading young uh then okay volume seven may be okay i i'm finding it a bit tedious because i've been studying this stuff for 35 years so <laughs> Well, and I think it, the way into Jung also deals with each per person's personality structure because sure. the way I went, I was given memory strange reflections right after I finished The Temple and Man, my arch mm -hmm. architectural thesis, mm -hmm. and as a nature of dwelling, a home. Um, but then, so I went to Tatter Cover and Books Bookstore in Denver when I got there, and I walked up to the Jung section. And I just closed my eyes in the midst of the 20 volumes on the shelf. And I just reached up and grabbed one. And so granted, there you go, but it was Ion. And, and I was right when, I know you, you got to chapter five, you know, Christ as self, and it was troublesome. And I just was jumping around the room saying just a hurrah, just like a cheerleader. <laughs> and my roommate was like, what, what, what's got you so happy? I said, look, look. And so to me, memory strings, reflections, I think is that first one and then different volume because I picked Ion and I was hooked. I mean, it was all the footnotes, all the Latin, all the Greek and, but it wasn't somehow dry. It still had this life in it. Um, but I, it depends, I think on personality, how someone gets into it. And yeah, I mean, I, I think Ion is pretty deep in, and we have to remember that Jordan had a, classical education by his two parents who were PhDs and uh, not everybody is going to pick up Ion and, and get it right away. Yeah. And, I was uh, happy to not read the Analects anymore or the classics. It's like, <laughs> no, <laughs> something right. new. It's like... <laughs> right. So, so, uh, you know, if you're just starting in Jung, I urge you to go over to memory stream reflections or man and his symbols uh, Man and His Symbols, I took one year 
to read it. And I read it to my wife as we were going to sleep every night. It was putting us to sleep every night. And it worked out quite well. At the end of it, we um, we really felt that we had had a year of psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. And, and so it was a very useful thing to do. We would read um, two or three pages a night. And I actually happen to have my copy still right here in front of me. Uh, this is the copy that I bought, which is a hardbound copy. And ideally, this is the one you want. If you go out and buy Man and His Symbols, you want the hardbound version because it has color pictures in it, among other things. And so it's easier to see what he's talking about in some of these images, whereas the I think the the paperback one actually omits some of the in, images, which is not helpful. Um, and um, so uh, there is an electronic version of this in our Dropbox too, by the way. Uh, and, and so it is possible yeah. to get it there. To Justin's point, I mean, I, I think what's interesting about two essays in, in analytical psychology, especially this particular appendix, this appendix um, it's, he's no longer talking about theoretical psychology. He's no longer using anecdotal examples. He's actually speaking to culture itself. And I think it makes right. I mean, things like moral, amoral, sexual, asexual, and et cetera, that I find this particular appendix might be the most um, accessible to everybody simply because everybody lives in culture. And then, but I would, I would suggest though reading this appendix and then moving on to something else and then coming back to the other parts of the book, because the rest of the book is the rest of the, like the rest of the work. Right. And I, I, but I am, I am enjoying this particular appendix because he's, he's telling it like it is without it. Right any mickey mouse and around so i uh, why don't yeah. you read three uh it's 4 30 yep why then the moral restriction out of religious out of religious consideration for a wrathful god irrespective of the widespread unbelief even the believer might quietly ask themselves whether if they were god they would punish every Jack and Jill escapade with everlasting damnation. (laughs) Such ideas are no longer compatible with our comfortable conception of God. Our God is too far tolerant to make a great fuss about it. Mean mindedness and hypocrisy are a thousand times worse. Thus the ascetically inspired and markedly hypocritical sexual morality of our time is robbed of any effective background. Or can we say that we are protected from excess by our superior wisdom and our insight into the nullity of human behavior? Unfortunately, we are very far from that. The hypnotic power of tradition still holds us in thrall. And out of cowardice and thoughtlessness, the herd goes trudging along the same old path. But man possesses in the unconscious a fine flair for the spirit of his time. He divines his possibilities and feels in his heart the instability of present day morality, no longer supported by living religious conviction. Here is the source of most of our erotic conflicts. The urge to freedom beats upon the weakening barriers barriers of morality. We are in a state of temptation. We want and do not want, and because we want, and yet cannot think out what it is we really want, the erotic conflict is largely unconscious, and thence thence comes neurosis. Neurosis, therefore, is intimately bound up with the problems of our time, and really represents an unsuccessful attempt on the part of the individual to solve the general problem in their own person. Neurosis is self-division. In most people, the cause of the division is that the conscious mind wants to hang on to its moral ideal, while the unconscious strives after its, in the contemporary sense, unmoral idea, which the conscious mind steadfastly tries to deny. 
people of this type want to be more respectful, respectable than they really are. But the conflict can, <laughs> yep, but the conflict can easily be the other way about. There are people who, to all appearances, are very disreputable and do not put the least restraint upon their sexuality. But at bottom, this is only a pose of wickedness. Assume for heaven knows what reasons. For in the background, they have a highly respectable soul, which has fallen into the unconscious just as surely as the immoral side in the case of the moral person. Extremes should therefore be avoided as far as possible because they're always aroused suspicion of their opposite. Yeah, well, that's definitely true. And uh, I have pr proven it in my artwork over the years. And um, uh, I, I'd like to qualify the extremes should be avoided though part because that's fine for the middle ground. But when you get to a point of solidarity with yourself where you're sovereign, you have your own authority, it's unquestionable, and but you're not that heavy-handed, mean-mindedness hypocrisy you mentioned before, then I think I'd put the quote in of everything in moderation, including, including moderation. moderation. Right. You know? So, uh, Amelia, you, uh, you have appeared, so do you, do you have a comment here? We'd love to hear your comments if you, if you wish. No, nothing yet. Um, uh, I'm just here with my cat Aphrodite. Uh, she just came back home. She was with my grandmother. Oh. So now, now she has like a whole different energy. <laughs> Better? Uh, I love the name. That, that's yeah. uh, very evocative. <laughs> she was, I adopted her from a gypsy family and the, the little boy was so sad. Um, but uh, I, I told him, you know, like uh, when you grow up, maybe you could take her back. <laughs> uh -huh. And has he come back for her? No. Uh, no, not, not yet. Not but yet. We'll see. I'm still here in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the cat is, is, is very healthy. She's mm -hmm. like uh, eight years old. Nice. Good yeah. for her. Um, we, we should all live to a ripe old age. <laughs> what, what country are you in, Amila? Um, I haven't, haven't uh, traveled. I've only, the most recent place that I've been to uh, is up north in New York. Oh, okay. So, oh, so, yeah, so, so you are in, living in America. You are American. Yes, I I live here in in Queens, New York. Uh huh. Okay. I'm surrounded by uh, Immaculate Conception, a Lutheran church, a Greek Orthodox church, um, a Bengali, Lebanese, and Moroccan mosques. Oh, great. A church that used to be a synagogue, but now is a, uh, uh, I don't think they're Mormon, but it's, it's interesting. We have more banks than churches here, though. Yeah, American community. <laughs> bank, machine, bank machines and <laughs> no, no rigid morality. <laughs> um, Okay. I like that you more, more banks than ecclesiastical structures. That's right. <laughs> that's good. Very good. Um, so anyway, um, so welcome. Um, I had an aunt and uncle who lived in uh, Queens for many years, and um, they both lived to be over a hundred. So it can't be all bad. <laughs> it's probably healthy for you. Uh, and it's quintessentially American, it sounds like. Um, so anyway, okay. Um, my turn, I take it. Yes. Okay, 431. Actually, that, there was a footnote nine when he was talking about hypocritical that I just noticed is long enough that we might want to put it in. Okay. 
Go for it. So go for it. When it he says, thus the aesthetically inspired and markedly hypocritical sexual morality of our time is robbed of any effective background. And his footnote is, the abolition of houses of prostitution is also one of the hypothetical pests of our hypocritical, famous- Hypocritical, hypocritical pit. Hypocritical, oh, look at that. Hypocritical pests of our famous sexual morality. Prostitution exists anyway. The less it is organized and looked after, the more scandalous and dangerous it becomes. Since this evil nevertheless exists and always will, we should be more tolerant and make the thing as hygienic as possible. If people had not worn moral blinkers instead of blinders, um, syphilis would have been put down long ago. So, right. So, um, let me go 431. Well, let, let's just uh, speak to this issue of syphilis. Syphilis was a scourge in Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century. Mm-hmm. And before that, of course, and even King George III, the king that we fought so actively against in the American Revolution, died of syphilis. And, mm-hmm. and uh, the the father of uh, Winston Churchill, Lord Randolph Churchill, uh, died of syphilis at the age of 46, believe it or not. And um, and so and it, in Jung's case, it was his father-in-law that had syphilis. And although he was the wealthiest man in Switzerland, he had in his many business travels as a purveyor of fine watches, um, picked up syphilis. And so the way Jung became close to his, the woman who became his wife uh, was that he kept visiting their household to treat the father. And his wife was 14 when he was coming into the house as a doctor to treat her father. And, uh, He said the first time he saw her, that's the woman I'm going to marry. Um, And um, so anyway, it was a real scourge until penicillin was developed and that proved to be a cure. Um, Although, you know, some, some sexually transmitted diseases have become, um, you know, impervious to penicillin now. So we have to be very conscious of this. Um, well, even Van Gogh, I think, had syphilis at the end. And, who and then a couple of Van Gogh. Oh, yeah. And coupled, coupled with um, lead poisoning and heavy metal poisoning because he held his brushes in his mouth when he was in the field so they wouldn't mm-hmm. get grass in. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I, I don't doubt that. And, you know, we... We know that the Mad Hatter was a real thing because the um, the people who made hats sewed hats together used uh, arsenic on their needles, and right. and it caused them to be crazy. Um, so we're slowly learning a few things about <laughs> physical health as well as mental. Health. Well, you know, in, even in lumber. Um, arsenic was used, I think, up until 15, 20 years ago mm-hmm. um, for fire, fire, any, any wood that was fire treated, was, mm-hmm. it had arsenic in it. Oh, God. So there's just even, even lumber, you know, something as mundane as lumber would be a conveyor in a house if it burned, someone inhaling, you know. Um, okay, so for the smoke of arsenic. Yeah. 431. This general discussion was necessary in order to clarify the idea of an erotic conflict in in analytical psychology, for it is the key to the whole conception of neurosis. Thence we can proceed to discuss, firstly, the techniques of psychoanalysis, and secondly, the question of therapy. Obviously, the latter question would involve us in details and complicated case material, which far exceed the scope of this short introduction. We must therefore be 
content to cast a glance at the technique of psychoanalysis. Now, what we should repeat here is that neurosis, which is um, a mental condition treated by psychologists, is when you have a conflict of duties, basically, where mm -hmm. um, and one of those, and he he's pointing out that this is one place where people became neurotic because they had the the church obligation of uh, not be, being adulterers, but at the same time they were human beings and and had you know na natural urges and. So what do you do when you have a natural urge and at the same time you're fighting with the church? Well, you become neurotic uh, because you have two, you're, you're mentally divided and conflicted. And so what the psychologist does is help you to draw a, a fence around your neurosis. It never gets cured. You have to just uh you know coordinate off until you find the right answer for you uh whatever that is and it may well, be and i think to find the right answer that is not the self-divided because right the, the fence is fine to isolate so that it's not you know spattered on everyone else but at the same time there's there's a deep i think need to dial in and dive into what is causing your division and i mean is it you know, you're, you're trying to do the morals of your parents, but this is what you want to do. You're trying to do the morals of someone else, the church, but this is what you want to do, et cetera, et cetera. And even I think Amila put a link, I think, to a portrait um, that about Salvador Dali's propaganda about um, sexually transmitted diseases. I, had, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to look at it. But so even the big artists of the time were on the bandwagon on one side or the other. And um, it's, it's interesting to me because then that's a more of the, the self division presented by people who are presenting you a moral view. But if you look behind their closed doors, then you're going to have quite a different story. And <laughs> that's a good link, Camille. I like that link. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> it's worth checking out. Um, do we dare put it out on the on the YouTube? May may I put it out on YouTube, Miller? Yeah, uh, they also have it. Um, it's also available on the Yale University uh, archives as well. If I can, mm -hmm. just it's called the Nude Skull, and it's by um, the American artist Philippe Halsman. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it was during the, um, was it post-World War One? Yeah, and must have so, been. Yeah, so uh, the, the men were coming back home with uh, like sexually transmitted diseases. Mm -hmm. So there was all this propaganda going on. And so... Uh, Salvador Dali, being who he is, a surrealist, <laughs> right. um, with pretty much no limits of his mind. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, those yeah. skulls are some of my favorite of his because the way he composed it, some people look at him and they go, well, what's wrong with this? It's just a big skull. And I like, look closer. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, so he did it so well, you know, that it, right. it, he used the bodies as paint as it were. Right. So yeah. Magic Sufi says, America is the only country to go from barbarism to decadence <laughs> without culture in between. <laughs> Quoted from Mark Twain. Yeah, no, that's, I, I love that because it's like, well, let's just take the, take the easy route. <laughs> oh. That's right. That's actually a really valid historical. Yeah, point. people but people wonder why why Americans will fight to the death for for 
our version of democracy. <laughs> it's pretty clear. <laughs> you know, you 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 want uh, you want the religion that lets you do whatever you want to do, no matter what they say in church on Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it comes down to the responsibly do no harm to somebody else. And right. in the end, do no harm to yourself. But then, you know, what what that is, is up for grabs between, you know, someone's going to go all vitamins or exercise or food or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's that's a really good straight from barbarism to decadence without any right. culture in between. Right. Now, um, in fairness, I, I said that we would stop at nine o'clock, and so yeah. I don't I don't think we should get into um, more. And, yeah, and we, this will be a tease for next week. Today is one zero one zero twenty two, uh, which is uh, in Chinese it's Shuang Shi. It means double ten. That's a very auspicious day, especially in. Um, nationalist China. Mm. Um, That's to look it up. Yeah, it's the date of independence from, I, I believe, from the Qing di dynasty when the Qing dynasty was overthrown. Um, so uh, we probably have put tracks for um, enough for people to listen to for the coming week and we'll continue. And, um, and thanks next, for those links, Camilla. Yeah, really, that that made her night. And uh, so someday late at night, I'll I'll do a art show of some of my work because I I did um, a lot of paintings that were uh, quite interesting. We'll have to do it late at night though, when when the kitties are not awake. Um, at least not in this country. That's. <laughs> <laughs> it's another country kind of allowed to watch it because they're more. <laughs> right. I wanted to ask you, Skip, how how um like how far are we allowed to go on on this channel? Um, because you know, you can go anywhere you want to go. Yeah, Doctor Jung in his previous volumes, um, as I was catching up, uh, he he discusses. Uh, um, like in the psychiatric studies, he discusses like uh, something that would be like incestual pedophilia. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these are all taboo and um, maybe it's a little too heavy. No, I mean, if, if you want to if you want to find a, a reference to it and and bring it to our attention so we can all discuss mm -hmm. it. I'm okay with it because I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm so done with Puritanism in the United States <laughs> and uh, because, you know, that hasn't done us much good either. Um, and, and also uh, opening up, Amelia, to those kinds of things here will give other people tools. They'll go, yeah. oh, I, I, that's familiar. Let me look into that. And then they yeah. actually might help people. Because yeah. instead of people hiding that because, oh, my God, it's the centerfold or it's something that's taboo, that's just making forbidden fruit out of the stuff that's really going to be the treasure for somebody. Right. I think I, I do operate a website. And so what I may do, um, which is called archetypeinaction.com, and what I may do is create an album on my website um that has my work on it and then very much as we've done here with your links we're not showing uh dally's work on on youtube so we can't be criticized for that but we can tell people well this is where you can go see see it if you want to of course everybody will go <laughs> but um but very very interesting uh thank you for spicing up yeah. our evening <laughs> for and, sure yeah because and, i was i'm sorry go ahead I, yeah because i was told um a few times in my early 20s when when there was that pressure of like when are you going to get married and start a family the younger the better so <laughs> um mm. 
Yeah, so there is this like uh, this uh, like I don't know if it's like a proverb or just like a saying or something like uh, it was something like uh, every every woman looks for a husband that that is like a man that's equivalent to her father or something like that like find a guy who's like your dad or something so that's where that came to mind this idea of like well you know if this was in in like psychiatry or something like that you know Mm -hmm. a mental health professional might kind of question that maybe you know like what do you mean like find someone just like your dad that's kind of well actually is that like incest you know or like in the psychiatric studies where where Jung discusses like this woman's fantasy of like her father so it's like is that symbolic or is it literal so it it just so many questions come to mind there are too, because I mean, from a psychoanalyst, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but from a psychoanalytical standpoint, mm-hmm. the purpose is to outgrow your parents and you, you find your own loves and likes. And right. it's the kind of thing where there literally is a child becomes the parent of the adult. I mean, birds are really good at kicking the you know little ones right out of the nest. And some of them we mm-hmm. see, oh, poor baby, it's dead. No, it couldn't fly. So it's the kind of thing where they're a little more, you know, bam, bam about it. But I think yeah. graduating from the parents, you're right. A psychoanalyst would take question with that and say, well, why are, why are you dating someone who's just like your dad? Um, isn't that incestuous in a reverse sense? And, um, and it is. And it's well, maybe, different. you know, that may be what, what my first wife was, uh, given to believe because she was expecting me to be like her father and we were of like age in fact my first wife was about four months older than me um and uh you know whereas my parents who stayed together for uh i guess 62 years um my father was four years older than than my mother and my mother did have I was born, um, well, let's say I was conceived out of wedlock. Um, I was born five months after they married. <laughs> and I didn't know that until their 50th wedding anniversary, when they when they admitted when their actual wedding anniversary was. They didn't up until that point. Um, but it worked out with, you know, with that age difference between the two and it was at a time when um, a woman could work in the home and the family could still prosper as middle middle class family which is you know basically what we did my father was a naval officer and um, my mother uh, was a homemaker and a very damn good one <laughs> on top of that and um and so um, it, w- it was a luxury that she had that she could work in the home and, and be in the home. And it meant a lot to me at, at multiple times during my upbringing that she was around and available. Um, yeah, definitely. And I, even like Amelia's example of, you know, her parents pushing, pushing, pushing for, you know, early marriage, early kids, that kind of thing. That's them pushing themselves. And, yeah. you know, when you say no, and it's my life, then you, you start to crack the cup and you, you grow and then you're not fighting your parents. You're just saying no, yeah. you know, and you're doing it your, instead of even saying no beyond that, you're doing it your way. And that's right. I so think that's the so my, my first wife wanted to, um, she went to Japan with me for five years, although she came home every summer for 10 weeks, but uh, she spent five years in Japan, including delivering one of our daughters in Japan. And, um, but then when we came back, she wanted me to just start a small town law practice. Uh, and, you know, I, I had to 
I mean, I didn't put it quite this way, but you know, what, what part of my international career where I speak two Asian languages, uh, did you not understand here? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you know, cause here I was running a company in Tokyo and all of a sudden she wants me to practice law in a small town. And I went to Tokyo to get away from that kind of practice. So I wasn't going to do that again. And, um, you know, I paid the price, but. Um, so, yeah, I personally, I mean, how far can you go? It's like, it's young, you know, it's, it's of the psyche. And so we're just right. respectful, I think, in regards to, you know, presentation. But at the same time, um, there are some topics that might be seriously taboo for other people. And they're psychological. So we can, if we discuss them psychologically, then. There you go. I mean, because yeah, it's a, absolutely. you get more more intense nourishment. It's fertilizer, as it were, because, you know, even well, when I, we're here in this book, if it's just me and Skip, you add some perspective to it. It just grows a bit. Yeah, it, it does. Um, one of the points that I like to make is that if, if you look at the osprey, which is a kind of bird, it's a raptor that's a, a seahawk. Uh, an osprey is a seahawk. And they have very a very clear life pattern, which is that um, the male, in order to get a mate, has to do a sky dance. Okay, has to do a sky dance. He has to build a nest for the female, and he has to bring her fish so that he proves that he can feed her while she's hatching their their chicks, and you know, that's really the fundamental thing that that I think men and women really need to understand, that women need security uh, while they're bringing babies along. And there was um, one, but after that, may, you know, maybe not, maybe you don't stick together after that. But there was an osprey in, I think it, she used to go to Scotland and she had produce chicks every year for like 30 years in in this huge nest and they always come back to the same nest and they have the same um, mate they mate for life and the nest that she was in was like a ton uh, it, it weighed like a ton up in the tree and finally she died and somebody else took over the nest but um but she's like the the great 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 grandmother of half the osprey in Europe at this point, you know, something like Queen Victoria. Um, and by the way, there's a very interesting um, thing on uh, it's a it's a mini series on Netflix right now called uh, The Empress. Uh, and it's it was originally um, done in uh, German because it's about Austria and it's about the Habsburgs. It's sort of like the equivalent of the Crown, the, the show The Crown uh, or Victoria, uh, but for the Habsburg Empire. And it's very well done, and it is dubbed in English. And the dubbing job is excellent. You really can't tell that you're not, they're not speaking English straight out. And uh, Deb and I looked at the first two episodes of it. I think it has six episodes. And uh, we watched the first two episodes yesterday. And it's very, very interesting. Um, excellent. The, so anyway, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to say good night to everyone and you. Uh, wish you a good week and we'll do our best to be here again next week if i don't show up jordan would you call me or something because <laughs> tonight you might have napped out <laughs> yeah ten, tonight i i came home from from teaching and i go oh my god and i was just totally wiped out because i had to get up at six and and teach art in, in an elementary school all day, which was just madness. <laughs> it's like being, you, you know, I think of, you know, training 
officer candidates in the Marine Corps. I thought that was tough. This is a lot more tough, a lot tougher than that. <laughs> I have more power to teachers is all I can say. Uh, yeah. So Amelia, you may not have heard Amelia, that I'm doing some substitute teaching for at least this school year to make yeah. some. How is it going so far? Well, it's going great. It's very interesting. Uh, tomorrow morning, I have to get up at five and leave the house at six oh. um, because I'm, I have a, a gig over on the other side of the county mm. and I'm going to be teaching all day with the same class and, and it'll be fourth grade. So I don't know anything about teaching fourth grade since I haven't paid any attention to the fourth grade since I was a fourth grader. And so it's going to be interesting. But fortunately, the uh, the teacher herself is going to be there. She's actually giving a reading tests to her students. So she's going to be able to guide me. But uh, the art classes that I've been done doing have been uh, wild. Uh, you know, you probably don't know that at the Naval Academy, um, Bancroft Hall, which is the dormitory for midshipmen, uh, houses the entire brigade of midshipmen. All 4,000 of them live in one building. It has 11 wings. Uh, and um, during the day, every, at every minute from, from Reveille to Taps, uh, the first, the plebes, the first year students have to run down the hall and every time they turn in a new direction, they have to shout, go Navy or beat Army or something like mm -hmm. that. And so the result of that is you have 1,200 young people who are all shouting mm -hmm. like this all day long. And it's just <laughs> bedlam there. And there's a reason that it's done. It's a, it's a screening reason, because if you can't handle that chaos, um, you're not going to be able to handle combat. But, but the reality is that, you know, working with um, second to fifth graders in an art class is like that mm -hmm. <laughs> or worse. <laughs> so more power to the teachers who hang in there. We ought to give them a rifle. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've been, I've been on, on the much darker side unfortunately I've, I've been watching that on netflix i've been watching the jeff da damier what oh the oh, uh, Dahmer. Mm -hmm. yeah Dahmer. the the serial killer uh -huh. who identified as a homosexual from wisconsin right i find it so fascinating like how his how his father is always protecting him and uh, his own protective factors. I am like so <laughs> bewildered by by this character. Just well, you know, I mean, it's creepy. But yeah, he's quite a psychological case. I mean, and right. and so right here on the surface, like that. I'm I'm actually about to start watching that. I haven't gotten to it. And I hesitated for a while. I'm like, well, I need to finish some other things. But so I wanted to pay attention because he it's it's a specific kind of and very convincing lying. I mean, it's he he just I've seen a couple of the memes was like, well, this isn't going to end well. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, because he's yeah. just so, like you said, protected. So, well, we we yeah. we avoid that story because. Yeah. Uh, last week was my birthday, and uh, dear friends of ours, a couple, uh, the, the man is a doctor who became a doctor mm -hmm. at age 50 after having, wow. been, having been an ambulance driver in New York City for mm -hmm. 18 years, and then he became a uh, physician assistant, and then he became a doctor, um, but he didn't become a doctor until age 50. And he's done a great practice around here. And now they're on the road. They've bought a, a camper, uh, one of these bus campers, which is it's a 42 footer that expands and so on. But anyway, that man, his uh, 
first fiance was one of Dahmer's victims. Wow. Uh, yeah. And wow. And and so you know it's it's just a very sensitive topic around here. Uh, oh man! And, you know, yeah. you know well, his, I I his mean, if we're, if we're sharing in the him. campfire, don't worry, Skip. My 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 personal experience of of crime is is like in the family, and um, I don't know if you want to Google Smayo Julic, but he was the the man who's infamously known as the intercontinental killer uh -huh. and he invited me to his apartment his vacation home and in uh -huh. my mind i'm thinking he's he's just like an old man who's like intellectually disabled mm -hmm. and then like years later i find out he was uh detained by federal agents and, <laughs> and he, i'm like oh he my was God, a serial no killer idea. he's a serial killer are you kidding wow <laughs> God, you're lucky. Thank God you didn't do it. You know, I but. slept over in his freaking apartment, you know, not knowing like, oh, my God, yeah. you know, so it's mm -hmm. like literally close to home. So right. I, wow. I totally understand. Yeah. Yeah. And well, it's interesting because I, I've noticed I noticed three people this summer that just set off all my red flags every single one of them and the ones that I will never not listen to. And, but then they were so convincing that then, and then I'm like, well, you know, here, let's go camping. No, I got to work this weekend. Oh, my car broke down. Can you go get and bring the no. And you know, it's my brakes. I need brake work. I, I made up. I don't know what, but there was just, oh, you this have to be so careful. With... Me. I mean, I look at the tag 18 miles out of town and I'm like, yeah. mm -hmm. and then 30 minutes later, Oh, it's okay. I hobbled all hobbled my car in and it made it and I got it all fixed. And I'm thinking, I just had my serpentine belt fixed the week before. Yeah. It did not take 10 minutes for my mechanic. I mean, yeah. so usually the pulley's involved and that's what freezes up. So, I mean, there were all these things and then two other people, I won't go into specifics, but there was just, I had to finally realize I'm trying too hard to want to believe them. And something's right. telling me no. And I'd rather err on the side that I can make these things in the evening than during the week. You know, so you I have to be up. very quiet, careful. My uh, yeah. my sister got uh, taken in by a confidence man who calls himself Simon Templar, which is, of course, the name of the saint the on the on the television program, the saint. Right. Um, well, that was also the name that. Uh, that was taken in the movie the saint by val kilmer right simon and, tipler like right he was a kid. right well so my sister got taken in by this guy and he's basically sucked her dry so that now mm -hmm. she has to live in a in a you know government living situation mm -hmm. um where where her her social security and her disability income has to be paid directly to the housing authority and then they give her the balance after their rent is paid uh, yeah. be, and she she literally got herself uh evicted because she gave all her money to this guy and as yeah. far as we know he's he's still after her and so well, and that's what a lot of people don't know i mean con man means confidence man right they, they they exude confidence you can't not believe them and it's it's way beyond salesmanship it's yeah there's yeah. a whole nother level of i don't know so that's kind of why i want to watch this because it's it's tricky <laughs> i mean it's it's easy it's easier to fool yourself than to convince mm -hmm. the fool that's been fooled that he's been fooled i mean kind of thing <laughs> whatever that quote is and, like half of our country right now holy smokes yeah. Yeah. He's, he's just like a an a plus sociopath i mean yeah. i don't know how this guy has these social skills where he's so charismatic and so calm like if i met him on the street i would be like oh yeah of course i'll go and hang out in your apartment yeah. you know <laughs> oh right yeah <laughs> and then uh. the stench and then the the, the satanic uh 
rituals book and it's like okay well how how what, how do you practice your satanic rituals <laughs> uh, yeah I don't pigeons think... are human pigeons <laughs> yeah, human pigeons. there you go so, good evening patrick nice to see you and uh hope okay, else can... Skip, i'm gonna respect your time thank you so much thank Have you a good night. thank you for being here thank, thank you Jordi. You. nice to thank see you, you tonight and uh thank you jordan and see we'll see, we will see you Wednesday because I'm taking Wednesdays off as much okay. as possible from now on. Okay. So take care.